All right. Good morning and good evening to you, Brian, and good afternoon to whoever is tuning in right now. Yeah, great to see you, Andy. How's everything been? Yeah, good, good, and good to see you, Brian. All right, so welcome everyone today uh, to another episode of Future Proof. Today is Thursday, uh, August eighteenth, two thousand twenty-two. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone's staying safe. Uh, great to see you, Brian, as always. Um, just doing a mic test. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? I hear you great. Cool. Uh, I can hear you fine as well. That is perfect. Okay, so uh, those of you who are just tuning in. Remember to share, like, and subscribe. If you're tuning in on YouTube, click on the bell icon, choose all, so that you're always notified whenever we come on. Uh, if you're on Facebook, follow us. If you're on Twitch, follow us. Don't forget to tag your friends uh, in case they're interested in, in in this topic, right? And as always, we we you know we have Brian on, uh, and all, he always gives gives us a lot of insights. Okay, so again, you know, feel free to throw in any questions you may have uh, as you're watching this, and then we will try to reply to them. Okay, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian, Brian Quinlevin from Sentiment. Uh, over to you, sir, to do a quick intro of yourself, and then uh, we can jump right into it. Yeah, great to be here, Andy. So uh, I am the Director of Marketing and Content at Sentiment. I do analysis on... Um, everything related to the crypto markets on the social end, on-chain end, what the whales are doing, um, DeFi related, NFT related. I try to give as much insight and daily content as I can to our community. And I come on here with Andy and the Equities Tracker team once a month to give an overview of exactly what we're looking at here on the crypto sector. Um, and that's about it on my end. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, also, you know, uh, so usually we come on on the second Thursday of every month, but uh, we skipped a week this week because last week, uh, you know, Sentiment actually had a, a Twitter spaces, a live Twitter spaces session on uh, which I tuned in on. So and I'll tell was, you right uh, now, Andy, we've got another one coming up a week from today and I'll give you the details about it uh, offline. It'll be uh wednesday morning my time so it might be late for you but hopefully not too late okay well cool uh, we will definitely share it with with our community over here as well uh it was a great session as always and uh lots of insights to be had so if, if you guys are uh, so one week from today when you guys you guys should tune in uh onto the twitter spaces all right so brian let's jump right into it what's happening in the market for sure. Yeah, let's talk some data. So it's been a very good 30-day uh, stretch overall. Uh, over the past week, though, if I toggle it over from 30 days here, showing the percent returns of the top 100 assets, Hang on. switch Let it over to seven. Screen. Oh, is it not shared yet? Sorry. Uh, it's shared now. All good. Okay. So we're looking first here now at the seven-day price returns. And you can see there has been a little bit of fading going on. Uh, for mm -hmm. many market caps, there's a few exceptions. Chili's has done very well. Uh, Celsius has rebounded. Uh, Shiba has had a, a very nice week as well. But looking at the, the longer term, the last 30 days, going back to mid-July, we see a ton of great returns. Bitcoin is still up 4% since mid-July. Uh, Ethereum still up 18% after its run, uh, nosing up above $2,000 before jumping back down a bit. And we can see some really big outputs from Ethereum Classic, Hex, uh, Chili's almost doubled, Flow did great. Uh, BitTorrent here did very well. Uh, Lido Dow had, had a great 30 day stretch. And then here's the very top one, Celsius, interestingly, uh, after all of its drama and the, the hack and, and bankruptcy, it's actually up to 56%, which is very interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's it's very tough. And, it, you know, I'm not in the, I'm not at all an expert at analyzing what happens to bankrupt or closing uh, companies. But obviously with a much smaller uh, uh, liquid market cap, it's probably a lot easier to, to bump things up or down for people who are still trying to manipulate the price. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, other than that, I, I can't give much insight as to what's going on with Celsius. What I can do though, is 
give a, a, a pretty good general market overview of exactly what we've been seeing and what we should see heading into mid-September, uh, where we're going to see that big Ethereum merge, which has really dominated headlines over the past uh, week or so since the announcement was made on the 11th by uh, Buterin and the Ethereum founders. Yeah, yeah. So so for those of you who are tuning in and you're not aware, uh, just catching you, you guys up on the news, uh, the there will be an Ethereum merge happening on September 15th, uh, where effectively uh, Ethereum that's on a proof of work uh, network right now goes into proof of stake. So um, everyone's talking about it. Um, every you know you've got both sides of the fences, right? You you you've got one camp that's saying you know we we want to uh, it should still be proof of work, um, and then there's the other camp that's very excited about proof of stake. Uh, and if I can just share uh, a little bit, uh, so coming from the traditional financial world, uh, proof of stake, the concept of proof of stake is nothing new. Uh, it's effectively uh, you know, what the regulators would grant, uh, you know, when they grant licenses to, you know, investment banks or or to to banks and, and, and to other financial institutions, they will usually have a capital requirement. So you have to have, you know, $50 million um, uh, paid up capital, for example. Uh, so effectively, that's proof of stake in the traditional sense, uh, in, in, in the traditional fin financial world. So that's what proof of stake is. Uh, so, so yeah, so it, it's it's going to be interesting uh, to see where this takes us, and and that probably explains why, you know, the Ethereum's kind of been been kind of choppy, hasn't it? It's kind of been up and down, up and down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a and well said by the way. That's that's a perfect uh, explanation of of what the upcoming merge is about. Um, the price action has been very interesting, and a lot of people that I've talked to in private circles have speculated that the prices may already be a little bit baked in, you know, the big wave of uh, Ethereum enthusiasts, especially during that, that downtick where it actually got below $900 just about two months ago, they really were accumulating then knowing that it couldn't really get much lower with so much uh, excitement going on behind this merge. Mm -hmm. And uh, by you know, the end of July, early August, when it peaked and hit that uh, hit a little above 2000, uh, that that was kind of the initial wave of people who were, were readying themselves for the merge. So for people wondering, you know, whether between now and four weeks from now, when the, the merge happens, uh, it's it's complicated for sure. And, and we, of course, can't really give investment advice. But it yeah. does appear that the volume has dropped substantially for Ethereum after what was going on two to three weeks ago. And it's likely starting to normalize now where it might be a case of buy the rumor, sell the news. Or if we start to see the drop between now and mid-September, then we would likely see, at least based on history when these things have happened before, a case where it sell the rumor and then buy the news after it finally happens, because it, oftentimes the average trader sees the direction of the price leading up to a big fork or event or merge of some type, and they assume, okay, when it actually finally hits and that clock strikes midnight, hypothetically, whatever the time is, uh, that is when you're going to see the price go into overdrive. Uh, based on the direction it's already going. But in reality, it's usually, you know, maybe one to, to three, maybe four hours of that. And then it actually just suddenly reverses to the opposite direction. So if you're trying to make a play around the merge, you know, I can't suggest what will happen, but based on history, there tends to be, you know, either a drop right before and then a rise after a few hours or a rise going in and then a drop after a few hours. That historically is what happens. Yeah, yeah. It's always difficult to predict uh, what's gonna, you know, what the big boys are gonna do, so. Yeah, and yeah. we'll definitely take a look at some Ethereum metrics on this call. And, um, you know, one other thing I wanted to mention, 
-hmm. is the fact that social volume, despite prices looking quite strong over the past 30 days, you can see Bitcoin is actually being discussed less, about 11% less compared to last month um, on crypto social platforms, including Discord, Telegram, Twitter, and Reddit. Ethereum's down 10%. Uh, you know, I wouldn't put too much credence in stable coins, but you can actually see that most of the discussion is going into a lot of altcoins here with all of this bright green. Matic up 165% in discussion rate. Uh, mm -hmm. Raptron 100%, Uni 114%. These are massive increases on yeah. some of the mid or small caps out there, um, while the, the top two big boys are kind of being ignored. Mm, that's interesting. It is. And, uh, you know, it, it's understandable, right? If you look at the prices, you know, yeah. Bitcoin was pretty boring at plus 4%. So, yep. of course, people are going to talk a lot more about Ethereum Classic or Chili's or a lot of these other assets. Matic has done great as well. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's something to keep in mind. And, and honestly, it's not ideal. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean we're about to fall off a cliff or anything. But we'd much rather see the topics of discussion flowing back into Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, because those are, especially Bitcoin, of course, those are the assets that really dictate where the rest of the markets go and yeah. if they're getting ignored and s coins you know what s stands for uh begin <laughs> to take a lot more attention from people it means that it's the market is starting to get saturated by a bunch of pump chasers rather than white paper readers if that makes sense yeah yeah well it's interesting you mentioned that the uh, ethereum classic uh has actually gone up uh, in terms of discussions because, uh, well, I'm going to assume that Ethereum Classic isn't going over to proof of stake. So um, I, this just came to me. I, I'm just you know thinking out loud whether those who believe in the proof of work, you know, security mechanism, um, whether they will jump ship back to Ethereum Classic because, you know, they feel that well, since it's sticking to its guns of proof of work, uh, they may go back to that. That that's that's actually that's interesting. Yeah, I, I had the same thought, and admittedly, I have not done enough research on what the the Ethereum Classic pump is all about. I do, I saw that it was pumping wildly during the uh, late July, early August timeframe, and that was exactly when Ethereum was going nuts and hitting that. Uh, what four month high or so and yeah. I, I think they're for sure related in some respects for exactly the reasons you just gave yeah well that's interesting mm. yeah cool cool but why don't we move into you know a few highlights uh monero and eos right now are dominating trending topics right now if we click on one monero has actually been on a pretty good run and decoupled a bit from the markets and uh, we saw right here, there was a big spike uh, five days ago. And you can actually scroll down and see, you know, Reddit and Twitter in particular really had a huge, huge influx of Monero discussion during that time. Uh, wow. And we can go back to EOS and see the same sort of situation there where we had just recently a pretty big spike here after an isolated one about, you know, 10 days ago. Um, so these would be ones to keep an eye on. Typically, when assets are seeing a big move in one direction, uh, it can often lead to a price top or a price bottom. I'm not seeing a huge move here for EOS right now. So, you know, it, it has kind of turned around right at this spot. I can zoom in a little bit if we just look at the last week. See how all of these social volume spikes are happening right at the bottom and then it attempted to go up a little. Yep. So that could be something to keep an eye on. Um, but this probably wasn't a huge enough spike to make a lot of waves. Um, yep. What you can do, though, is look up something else such as um, we can look up merge, for example, and we can see the huge spike that occurred right here, uh, right when the devs announced that the date would be the 15th and 16th of September. So everyone was talking about it. And interestingly, if I jump all the way back to a year, just look at a year of data, we can see that most of the spikes revolving around the merge going back to this one in December, they immediately are followed by a drop. 
Uh, this one happened way back here, about a day before the December 3rd drop. That was a big one. This one was more of a gradual drop. This one continued drop. Um, this one, of course, was market wide, but the merge was being discussed a lot right before it fell off the diving board. And then this latest one, if I zoom in once again, you can see that all these social volume spikes happened here. And then another kind of mini one started right here and another drop. So call it a coincidence if you will, but I, I've seen enough evidence to show that anytime uh, people start to look ahead toward the merge, uh, there could be a few whales trying to take profit and capitalizing on that hype, despite us still having quite a ways to go until it happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. No, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for the insight. For sure. Yeah. It's always nice to look at how these trends are dictating where markets go next. So, Hey, um, Brian, going back to that Monero one, um, I'm just wondering, was that when Tornado Cash was sanctioned? Like, yes. Would, would, uh -huh. I, I believe that's what it was related to. Um, okay. It was all right here on the 12th. And that okay. was the day that I was hearing all about Tornado. So, yeah, this was all about, uh, you know, the privacy aspect of Monero and how people kind of use that as a natural alternative to a very sketchy uh, platform like Tornado Cash. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, Monero and Tornado have often been brought up together as ways to successfully move uh, money off the grid, whether it's from a hack or um, to avoid, you know, the government recognizing that you've done so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. And yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is that's where the price bottom hit too. And Monero has had a bit of a, a run. I should move it over to XMR. So apologies for that. So yeah, you can, same thing. You can see that the bottom hit here yeah. and it, it started growing ever since it's been through its normal volatility as Bitcoin's fluctuated. But especially right here, just in the past, I don't know, 12 hours or so, this has been a pretty big rise compared to the rest of the markets that have mostly just gone like this. So yeah. Monero's kind of stayed a little above right now, and it might be worth keeping an eye on because of its increased uh, interest now that Tornado Cash is no longer an option for people to stay off the grid. Mm, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And I think the EOS one, although that wasn't a, a like a, a big spike, um, that may have something to do with them uh, offering staking rewards. Maybe they 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 have about four hundred forty million staked on the on, on on their platform now. I think. Gotcha. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. That that sounds like it makes a lot of sense if it happened right around the past twenty four hours. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Cool. Yeah. Nice. But for the sake of uh, sake of time, let me jump over to a few main metrics. Um, yeah. Probably the the most important that a lot of people would be wondering about if they've tuned into our previous streams is what the whales are doing, uh, especially yeah. Tether and Bitcoin. And we look at two key whale tiers for each of them. For Bitcoin, we look at one hundred to ten thousand Bitcoin wallets. And the reason for that is because anything over about 10,000 typically uh, is largely attributed to exchanges and anything under 100, they're, pro they're, they're not necessarily millionaire addresses. Right now, 100 Bitcoin is worth about 2.3 million. So yes, um, you know, 50-ish is still millionaire status, but the lower you go, the less impact they have on moving markets. So this is kind yeah. of our fairly safe and reliable way of looking at where they're moving markets next. And you can see over time, it's pretty, pretty damning how much impact their decisions make and accumulation and dumping has on future price movements. And ever since late October, they have really, really, really dropped down. But we're seeing a little bit of encouragement ever since the start of August. It isn't much, but you can see that they were holding about 46% on the nose to about 46.13%. Um, and that 0.12% increase is pretty substantial when you talk about the actual 
absolute amount of Bitcoin, which I can show here in red. And it's, it's, uh, oh, I see why it's because it's showing tether one sec. So if I go to Bitcoin, yeah. yeah so if we go here, look at August 1st, it looks like they have added collectively about 27,182 Bitcoin since the start of the month. And that's pretty significant, especially when you look at such a large downswing for a substantial amount of time. It's almost refreshing to at least see a minor uptick, which we've seen on occasion, but this could have some legs to it. Yep. Yep. On the other hand, we have the Tether uh, shark and whale addresses. We like to look at anywhere between $100,000 all the way up to $10 million. Uh, because there aren't as many huge, huge players in Tether as there are in Bitcoin. <clears throat> and really, we're seeing kind of the same thing uh, ever since maybe the last week of July, there was an attempted accumulation and then a resuming of that beginning in early August. And with both Tether and Bitcoin at least creeping up a little bit, it's encouraging to see that the buying power in Tether is uh, improving a bit and more is is going into large wallets which can lead to very big purchases in the upcoming future so we like to see that both of these lines are going up together and when they're both going down together that's when you see these huge green bars of price going down and down and down that's interesting yeah and we can also yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, 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 are we seeing potentially the whales starting to to accumulate again? Yeah, I mean, look, we've seen we've seen this maybe one, two, three, four times before this one, where there was an mm -hmm. actual stretch of two weeks of accumulation. But yep. unless it's like really significant and we start yep. seeing something like this, we can only yep. be mildly excited. But at yep. the very least, we can say, you know, this pattern of of 10 months straight of dumping has yep. taken a breather and it's actually moving in the right direction for once. So that's yep. a good sign, especially when buying pa power with Tether is going up as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's it's a, a moderately good sign. And yes, they are objectively accumulating right now. It's just not a, a long enough stretch for us to be um, over the moon and predicting a, a bullish breakout. Yep. Yep. Fair enough. So to be uh, cautiously optimistic, as they say. Perfectly said. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So another thing we can look at is the NVT uh, model, which basically calculates the amount of token circulation happening on the network compared to market cap over time. And, um, you know, as, as uh, much as we'd like to see that Bitcoin is starting to really circulate among addresses after a decent rise after going below uh, into the 17Ks last month, uh, it's not really happening. The circulation is staying pretty low and we can validate that with our template here. Uh, the first chart on it is our circulation and we can see this the pink line is every single day of circulation the red line is kind of a smooth moving average mm -hmm. and between last month and now uh we went from 234,000 bitcoin circulating to just 151k now and that's the lowest we've seen it since october so it's at a 10 month low right now and that's why this model for the month of august is showing the first bearish divergence in circulation since September of last year. And uh, until that changes, we have to be a little careful because if Bitcoin circulation is struggling and that asset begins to, to bleed a bit, you better bet the rest of the crypto markets will as well, no matter how exciting any sort of merge or anything else will be. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of a good news, bad news kind of situation so far where we showed whales accumulating a little, but overall amounts of unique tokens is uh is lacking 
quite a bit here. Hey, um, Brian, what was the peak uh, token circulation uh, historically? Like, when... yeah, great question. Um, yeah. I believe, I believe it might have been in that 2017 bull run, but it actually wow. could have been more recent than that, simply by the added amount of participants. Uh, I wouldn't count this because this was kind of before we had full data. Okay. So we'd really, yeah, it was it was late 2017 here, where oh. we saw a peak very very similar in mid 2016, and oh. then this one, this bull run, at least from my experience, yeah, uh, that was when I first started hearing about crypto and Bitcoin, and I started studying it on a daily basis. You know, yeah. everyone joked about the Thanksgiving dinners around this time, where everyone was. Uh, introducing their family members to crypto and yeah. then they basically fomoed them in right before the top happened <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. well so. you know that that's um that's some well some insights that i i gained from from this chart here would be um maybe in 2017 it was more uh, retail led whereas yeah. you know the recent one is more institutional led so there's less token circulation because there's less you know well they've there's more institutions. This, you have, you know, uh, fewer institutions with much deeper pockets. Yes. Whereas back in 2017, there were mainly retail investors, and so you know there were a lot more of them. Yeah, I think that's a, a very fair assessment that has some truth to it for sure. Um, you know, when overall you want to see a rising amount of circulation, um, and that does lead to good things. But there are a lot of variables, and this is only one yeah. on-chain metric that has to do with the overall amount of utility related yeah. to the asset. We like to pair it with the one below it, which is the amount of daily active addresses over time. And oftentimes this will lead uh, big bull runs. Uh, it's I know this green line's a little faint. Let me see if I can darken it a bit. Um, so that's the price here in dark green. Orange is daily active addresses, and you can see it peaked just as the price peak was happening. So if you were seeing this peak and you saw this kind of drop, that would tell you, oh boy, we're probably on the path to correction right now because we're just yeah. not getting the same participation. And pretty much the exact same thing happened on the March and April one, and then to a smaller ex extent on the true all-time high in October and November, where there was a peak in daily active addresses, and then a big drop off this one here and then a slightly smaller drop off but either way you know we're we're on the decline a little bit for mm -hmm. uh, the amount of unique addresses participating on the network and until yeah. that changes again just like circulation we have to be a bit cautious uh that there could be a, some further downside at some point until the overall amount of participants whether they be institutional or retail start to pick up a bit you know what's interesting about this chart, um, Brian, is that if we zoom out uh, far enough, um, I guess for for a perpetual bull like myself, in terms of um, uh, Bitcoin adoption, uh, you will see that you know from where it's come from, um, we're still on a like you know it is yeah yes we've we've had some peaks and troughs, but but it's it's on an overall kind of a, from a longer term perspective, it, it's adoption or uh, usage or daily active addresses. It seems to be on 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 an uptrend. Like it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, overall, this is what you want to see in an asset is a continued uh, yeah. line that looks a little something like this, right? I can draw it. And, mm. you know, very clearly the amount of interactions on the network over time is still growing given a long enough uh, zoom out perspective here. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, that's what you want to see, whether it's daily active addresses or circulation, which is a little more up and down. Uh, but, you know, another one would even be development activity. And Bitcoin's a bit of a weird one since, you know, the developers and Satoshi are kind of a mystery. But yeah. you can see that over time, uh, you know, that's the kind of development activity you want to see, you know, rising yeah. over time rather than, you know, barely existent or falling. And, yeah. you know, Ethereum has the same thing going um, even to a, a much wider degree. 
where I go down to development activity, if I can find it again, there we go. And there, I mean, if I just go to like 2015, we'll ignore the rest. That's, that's what you wanna see, just overall rising amounts of uh, GitHub submissions happening from the team, uh, showing, if nothing else, that they probably aren't expecting you know, any sort of rug pull or departure from the, the, the asset. They want to make the asset more available and more mainstream and um, adopted by you know, any sort of payment accessible process out there. And the way to do it is by making sure that you're keeping up with the times and adjusting for any bugs, ensuring that it can be capable of more and more as Ethereum's doing with its merge next month. Even if it's a polarizing move, uh, this is the kind of thing you want to look at as proof that the asset you're putting your hard-earned money in is worthy and and probably not going to be messed with, at least relative yeah. to some other coins that are much more prone to be messed with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow, cool. That's really cool. Thanks, thanks for that, Brian. Do you have anything sure. else that you'd like to share in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I know we're running up on time already, but uh, just a quick overview. Why don't I, I move over to this model actually? So this is our MVRV opportunity danger zone divergence uh, model that'll show when a coin is becoming overbought or oversold based on average trading returns. And this isn't just, you know, Bitcoin's up 10% and therefore the trading returns are up 10%. What we do is we look at different periods of time, uh, whether it's one day or seven days, 30, 90, 180, or 365 days, and we see blended between the short, mid, and long-term timeframes, which ones are starting to be um, in an opportunity zone or in a uh, danger zone, if you will. And of course, it loves to do a refresh when I open this model. It doesn't. It likes to troll me from time to time, but as it... <laughs> As it uh, refreshes here, it's going to start showing which assets are undervalued and overvalued. I'll, I'll step away just for a minute while, while it can do its thing. And I'll just sure. show the MVRV on this one. Sure. And this is showing the 30-day average trading returns. And typically, anything below 15% for 30-day means you're in a safe zone. If it starts to go above like it was during the October all-time high before the final November all-time high, that's when it's telling you that you're starting to get really inflated. And even if you're seeing an enticing final run-up, uh, this danger zone is telling you that you might want to be pretty careful um, just due to the fact that there can be uh, a lot of people losing money to get the MVRV back to 0% where it rests at no matter what the time frame is. So right now, it's actually right back at neutral. However, the long-term 365-day average trading returns, it may not seem like it, but it's actually at about native 33% still. So that leaves a lot of meat on the bone on a long-term time scale, showing that it's still long-term undervalued and neutral when it comes to short midterm trading. So that's interesting to see for sure. Um, and as you can see, a few of these pop up, you're seeing that a lot of altcoins are looking semi underbought right now when it comes to blending the short, mid and long-term timeframes all together. So the sandbox, for example, it hasn't had a lot of success. So it's starting to get close to that opportunity zone. OKB on the other hand, uh, OKEX's native token, it had some huge gains over the past 90 days and that's why it's showing as overbought, so that might be one to be cautious with. We can also see one inch is up there, compound, curve, decentraland, OMG network, and scale especially looks to be one of the closest to the opportunity zone. Um, you wanna avoid something like Celsius and Chili's perhaps based on history due to the fact that they have really ran up a lot and as the rest have filled in now, you can see Bitcoin is neutral and Ethereum is neutral right now, just to give you an idea. So they're continuing to look like the more boring assets, if you will. Um, 
but they're still relative safe havens compared to the much more volatile assets that are mostly showing a little bit of undervaluation right now. So, Brian, for a subscriber, uh, a pro subscriber to Sentiment, how would they be able to access uh, this model? Yeah, thanks for asking. So it's super simple. It's not this URL. This one wouldn't work. Uh, but we have a baseline URL uh, for every single Sandsheets model we have. This is our MVRV one. What you would do is take the URL, you go to file, make a copy, then you load that copy. It won't show any data yet. You simply download the extension called mm -hmm. Sandsheets, and then you're going to plug in the API that comes with your Sandbase Pro membership or the trial that you open. Um, and you can get a trial instantly, or you can buy Sandbase Pro instantly uh, with code Equities Tracker, and you get an instant 25% off of the uh, price, which is really nice as well. Cool. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of investors and traders out there would love to get their hands on 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 this. I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're not going to depend entirely on one metric to you know for your trades, but uh, I'm, you know, it, it, I mean, sentiment has so many metrics uh, on 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 the website that it's uh, you know obviously you you have to combine different metrics in order to sort of form a a more exactly well well-rounded perspective. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm actually working on a model now that's kind of attempting to blend some of our top metrics together and give them all kind of a one to five scale, one being bearish, five being bullish. You know, you add them all in a pot and take the average and, and then we'll be able to actually give like a, a one to five rating with three being average on how bullish or bearish the main metrics on sentiment are looking. So that's coming soon. I can't give you an exact time frame, but I'm really excited to finally get it. Uh, I guess I would say uh, workable and providing enough proof of of prediction power to release to the public. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, look, I, I think we're uh, we're probably uh, up in terms of time. Thank you for sharing today brian always do you, do you have any 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 last words or well not last words but you know any any last message you'd like to share with the with the audience i don't think so yeah i mean obviously we didn't cover it today but there's still a, a big correlation between crypto and equities right now so yeah. um whatever the great analysis that andy is giving you guys right now um it's probably still going to overlap into where crypto prices are are heading so in addition to what you're seeing on the on-chain and social side here, uh, definitely soak in, you know, the FOMC decisions coming up, um, inflation concerns, and all sorts of madness that's happening here in my neck of the woods in the U.S. because they're, they're still dictating how the rest of the world is fluctuating right now. They definitely are. They definitely are. Yeah. And um, so how, how are things over in your neck of the woods right now? Yeah, I mean, other than it being uh, very hot in, in California and having a lot of people uh, pretty much declaring that COVID is over, it's, it's pretty much, you know, just very high gas prices. They're putting together an inflation uh, prevention act, which is allowing uh, inflation to obviously subside and get back to normal so a lot of people are hopeful that that's going to help it should sell help the average family uh save four figures a year we'll see how true that actually is but the effort is there to try to get this this concern corrected and uh, i'm excited to see how how it plays out nice do keep us uh updated on uh on, on that well i'm sure we'll talk about it in the next call yeah. so hey Brian, thank you once again so much for coming on and thank you for sharing the, your insights uh, using the Santiman platform. It's been great. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to have you on. It's always a pleasure to to hear those insights uh, with, with the on-chain metrics because it's, it's you know, it, it gives you an insight. Well, I wouldn't say an insider glimpse, but really, it, it you know, you, you really, you become more data-driven in your investment decisions because now you have, 
more clarity of, of what's actually happening on chain. And right. that is something that I've said, I've said again and again, and is that you don't get uh, these deep insights in the traditional financial markets with stocks and all that. It's, you know, um, so this is, this is just fantastic. I mean, Thank the you, fact Andy. that you know what the whales are doing <laughs> as Pretty they're helpful, doing it. Yeah. yeah it's very helpful. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um it, it's a fantastic tool. Um, you know, I I I I would use it, and I do use it on a daily basis, uh, several times a day. So, um, those of you who are more data driven in your uh, investment activities, especially with crypto, um, I highly highly recommend using the Sentiment platform. Appreciate it, my friend. Well, All right, well, I'm time for dinner. Looking forward to chatting. Yeah, I'm going to get some dinner. Uh, if you guys are free uh, in about a week, we are going to be doing that Twitter spaces. I'll give you the deets soon, Andy. And sure. um, in the meantime, you know, take care and stay safe, everybody. You too. Take care and stay safe. Bye, Bye. guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.